to these states, great pavement, twerk to the intro beat, all day it, give it to the DJ, like fuck it, I'll play it, hesitate to Giuseppe, like fuck it, I'll say it, fuck it, I'll say it, hesitate to delay it, Canada, Miami, Cacalac to the Bay it, Tennessee, Patron, Cisco, Sardinia, no ass betting, set tripping, fuck it, I'll say it, fuck it, I'll say it, now, nah, fuck it, I'll say it, check you on your bullshit, fuck it, I'll slay it, I got the lane, boy, should I slam it or lay it, I'ma shoot my two cents, like fuck it, I'll say it. Yup, 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 GDU, season two, how we do, seriously outside for you today. We still on the same topic, change the scenery a little bit, er, er. all my drama kings and queens, remember this. Remember your first time in Central Bookings? <laughs> Remember your first time going to Central Bookings? Remember how cold it was? And that cell, I don't know. What was your first time going to bookings? Did you go in winter or was it summer? And you could freeze to death both seasons. And matter of fact, you could freeze to death quicker in the summer in central bookings than you can in the winter time. And only my street vets will know why that is. Matter of fact, I don't even want to give y'all an answer and hit me up in the comments tell me if you know the answer to why is that no, why it is that you can freeze to death quicker in central bookings in the summertime as opposed to the winter and yes i wish that dog would shut the fuck up and i wish all this traffic would stop but i just really wanted to get this backdrop you know what I'm saying? This is the scene I set. This is the, the scene I saw. And this is the scene I'm running. I remember my first time. And it was the first time I ever got in trouble. Like it was it was big. I fucked up big and, and, and went there. My first time was an F. It wasn't no type of misdemeanor. It wasn't no goddamn open container charge. Feel me? And I didn't even know whether or not I was gonna get bail, much less make bail. Two different things. I remember the smell. The smell is the worst thing. That's my little cameraman with me. Camera woman, camera girl. The smell is the thing that lets you know how fucking deep in trouble you really are, bro. That smell. It got a distinct smell, bro. The smell, I can't describe it in no other way but trouble. That smell smells like trouble. Pink slip trouble. Trouble. You know what I'm saying? It's surreal. It's people talking around you. You would think that there's nobody joking in there, but it's a bunch of people joking and laughing and you know what I'm saying? You start talking to people, you start relating and sharing uh, experiences. And before you know it, you know, it, all that fear of the unknown, as, as far as it pertains to being in that cell, is gone. Or that's if, you know, you're of that uh, mind culture of a street survivor. Punk shit always draws dumb shit victims you feel me yeah you definitely got a ride for yours yo. it ain't prison it ain't even it's jail but it's not prison it's an experience that even some people that's not criminals will go through basically that's how i describe it that's how i put it stay out of bookings kids i i say all kind of things in my shows and give all kind of tips and lessons because I don't want you to experience central bookings. The thing about it is it's an L. It's a big fat fucking L. Like, even if you go there on some open container shit, you go there for smoking on the plateau or, or, or taking a piss in the back alley or some shit and 5 -0 scoop you up for some dumb shit like that. Like, you know, you do that little few hours and, or you, you, you're 48 hours or so. That's when they really being assholeish. And then like you stay in something there for something like that for 48 hours, the whole 48. And 
It's an L, B. Like it's a it's a loss in your life. It's a scar. That'll stay with you forever. And sometimes a little technicality can fuck around and be uh, the death of many good things to come in the future. Real talk. Stay out of that bitch. Misdemeanor or felony. You get caught with a felony, you're definitely going. You get caught with a misdemeanor on a misdemeanor charge, you might not see past the precinct. That's the most trouble you should ever get in in your life. You go get having to go to the precinct and, and, and getting le released on your own recognizance. Making it to central bookings means you officially got into trouble, bro. That reminds me, right? If you don't know about this, you you ain't, bro, hang it up. Like, especially if you call yourself 90s and 80s running wild. You gotta know this. The 380 locking. <laughs> Who remembers the 380 locking? Crack Diesel, where you at? Remember the 380 locking, bro? Ah, I heard that in a Beanie Siegel run. That's how grimy and grungy that is. Philly niggas got them scared in the building. Guess they saw one too many bids in the building. The 380 locking. That was my first gap. That was the gap that put me in that truck. Central booking. That's the gap that sent me straight to central booking. Don't pass gold. Don't collect $200. None of that shit. It could have, if my parents wasn't so proactive, sent me to Rikers. That's the next step. Or uh, Bronx House or one of them joints. You know what I'm talking about, though. That was the cheapest, coolest, prettiest, little, neatest little gat that you could cop for yourself <laughs> for four yards and under. Three yards and under. That was like the Hyundai XL of guns. <laughs> ah! The Hyundai XL of guns, you like that. The 380 locking was our uptown Saturday night special. Brooklyn, I know y'all, y'all had the Smith and Wesson deuce deuce. That was the infamous Brooklyn gun, you feel me? A little shit slapper. 222s in my shoes, right? That Brooklyn shit. But in the Bronx, it was the 380 locking. It's a bullshit gun. Piece of shit. But damned if I ain't style a few niggas with that. <laughs> Some of them in a hostile way. I just had to let it bark. Like, I had like three bullets. <laughs> Bro, one time I went to co-op the Bay Plaza with my girl at the time to see a movie and I had the 380 locking on me. And I let two fly. Uh, some section five dudes thought they was gonna style me and I let two fly in the air. <laughs> <laughs> section five, you, you wasn't, I was sharper on the whistle than y'all that night. Cause I know how y'all do. I know how y'all do people coming in the Bay Plaza at that time. That was them dumb times. Thank God we all grew up, right? Yeah, I, I wasn't having it that night. It wasn't going down. Not not with her with me. No sir, Bob. Not with me with the hoopty and the... What I had on? I had on the... Um, the 10 Buttersoft uh, Mark Andrew. Nah, it just wasn't happening. Let two fly. Fuck it. Two in the air is better than two straight. Hey! Remember today's math? Remember this! Today's math! Bro! Who remembers today's math? What's today's date? What's today's date? The 23rd? Uh, wisdom understanding? Huh? It's the 23rd, right? Wisdom understanding? If I'm not mistaken? Lord J? Salute to you, God. Salute to you, God, yes. Salute to the God, Lord Jamal, and the God cast. I always bring up Lord Jamal because he was special to me and my brother. And I always told y'all that I would tell y'all a story about Lord Jamal and our little connection we had with him for a brief second. This is right about the time when 
he dropped Love Me or Leave Me Alone and all that. That album, that classic shit, those times, it's like 90 something. He used to date who is now known as Salute to You, Ma, Mama Cash. I think they and y'all are out in ATL. Salute. She a beauty queen. Like, this is a big woman in the community right about now, you feel me? Lord Jamal, in those times, she was living in New York and it just so happened that she was dating Lord Jamal. And Lord Jamal was such a great dude because he used to come through and, you know, she, she lived in my parents' house. So we had access to do, you know what I'm saying? Like a different kind of access, uh, past fans, you know? And Lord Jamal used to let us come downstairs sit down, he used to give us lessons. He taught us the whole math from A to Z. You know what I'm saying? He gave us the science. And I'll always salute you for that, big bro. Uh, the God, Lord Jamal. I could, I, that ain't no lie, too, that's real talk. He used to talk to me and my brother, especially. I mean, like, spend a couple hours good down there. You know, every time he used to come see his shorty, like, that that's giving of yourself, bro. Cause we was little kids, we was little kids to him. But we were old enough, we were teenagers, we was old enough to understand what his teachings was about. And he, he poured it on, he gave us all the math, he, he taught us all the knowledge, he did the knowledge with us. You know what I'm saying? And this was when 5% and the 5% community was crazy strong in New York City. And it was a time, that was the times when if you didn't know today's math and you was sat tripping or fronting and you got caught not knowing the knowledge, I'm not gonna say anything else. Remember this. Remember Cali gangster rap? Woo! Remember this? I'm repping it right in New York right now. Yes, uh, my LAGs. But I want to salute all of y'all, you know what I'm saying, on the other side of America. The thing with LA gangster rap was it would, there's no mistaking it for nothing else. You would never hear LA gangster rap and uh, mistake it for New York hip hop or Southern fried hip hop. You feel me? Midwest hip hop, none of that. You will never, ever, ever mistake it for anything like that. LA gangster rap had its own sound. Niggas like <clears throat> MC8, Westside Connect, Death Row. Snoop and Corrupt and all of them. Daz, my man Raskas. He was one of my favorites. Very, very underrated MC, slept on. That sound with those strings. They had a thing with strings and guitar riffs. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't about boom bap. Like New York was more that boom bap at the time, but that's what differentiated, you could differentiate them so easily. And it was a smooth gangster-like sound that I missed. And now, when I'm on YouTube, I'll have a playlist, and I'll make that playlist everything that resembles MC8 and how he sounded on Menace to Society. Holy shit, that, 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 that was my dude, MC8. And that was the fire, the sound was fire. It was so different from New York. And a lot of New York guys used to front on it you know, just trying to be extra patriotic to the to the city and just not being open-minded. I, I myself was guilty of that a few times because I'm an MC. When you're an MC, everything and everybody you see when you look around looks like competition. Like, oh, you feeling them dudes over there? Okay. I got something for him. I was pro New York as well, but not too pro New York to not be able to recognize their sound. Totally 
different from ours. The only guy that really kind of played defense with a real ninja-like balance was Tupac. Tupac was the only one that could make LA rap sound like New York and make New York rap sound like LA and played both sides of the fence. He was a real mutt, Tupac. He had no pedigree. What, I said that. Pac, I love you to death, but he was a mutt, bro. He was from everywhere and nowhere at once. You couldn't identify him. You couldn't just wrap him up with a city or a state. He was bigger than that. For those that think that that was some kind of diss to, to my G. No, stop it. I don't disrespect legends, especially ones that have already passed away. Very disrespectful. And me and Pac got a shaky relationship. Word up. That shit you said with um Prodigy about the sickle cell hit me just as hard. And I still say fuck you for that. You went past the line. You always do that though. Y'all Geminis. Y'all just know how to go past the line. But uh, I love you though still. I'm, I'm fucking around. <laughs> I'm fucking with you. But you know what you said. Remember black exploitation heroes? The best! That was real life superheroes that could play the clown but never the coon. The backdrops and the scenes would be in places like this. You know what I'm saying? Like your man Fred Williamson be chasing after somebody down this alley somewhere, and then money will fall down, and then he'll take his guy out and be like, bam, 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 and then run and jump underneath the thing. That ain't never been my style, brother. Ah, oh, that's my Fred Williamson imitation right there. GDU, remember this? I'm in the dugout, baby. I don't know why I keep making the same introduction. It's the same show. I claim that which is old, cause I'm Giuseppe, and I'm just throwing some old frisbees at you. You ain't catch in eons. You feel me? It's a feel-good thing, baby. So I pick up my trusty paper, cause I'm basic like that, and proceed to continue. Remember this. You love how I say it the Shabo way too, right? You know what I'm saying? I got all kinds of accents. Don't kid yourself. Oh, I mean, yo, I mean, bruv. Don't fuck about South London. Where's my hottest field? Gangsters. Where's my Manchester Roadman them? And yo, it's hot out here. I sacrifice my comfort for you people. Can you dig it? I'm gonna put my baseball hat on right now. It's quite appropriate. I don't wanna look cool with the glasses right now. So, uh, speaking on this, remember the 2G Subway series? Ah! All y'all cities in America could eat your heart out, baby, in the year 2000. New York's year. That was the year that the Yankees played the New York Mets in the World Series. New York playing New York for the world to watch, baby. The domination. Bernie Williams and Derek Jeter was the flyest dude in New York for like two summers straight. Squad, surplus. But that Yankees team though, that was an all time team. You know like when you play live and you pick the all time squads? The 2000 Yankees is definitely an all time all world squad. Who they had? Who we had? Who we was rocking? We was rocking. Derek Jeter, I said, Bernie Williams, Mariano, the closer, Rivera, doing that little thing I do. Do you know what I mean? That little thing I do. Remember that? The closer doing that little thing that I do. Pretty boy, Andy Pettit, El Duque. We're in a dugout right now. This is just baseball, American baseball, New York history. Jose Canseco was on that squad, for crying out loud. We had all the flyest dudes. Davis Justice, dude that shitted on Halle Berry. Huh? Drama, typical New York shit. Roger the Rocket Clemens. You know, we got steroids, drama. Roger was my dude. That boy was blowing a hundred something miles per hour. Don't let the steroids fool you. You could take a million steroids. If you play baseball, 
steroids does not give you the skill to hit the ball. You can't hit a 100 miles per hour strike just because you take steroids. It won't give you the skill. It'll add on to your strength a little bit on the screen right here. But uh, same deal. The steroids uh, scandal was played out of pocket, I believe. I believe like, bro, steroids could do more for you in football and um, things like track than it can in baseball. Baseball is 60% high eye-hand coordination skill and 40% strength. It has, it don't, it don't got a lot to do with that. I know dudes want the ball going out the park, up a deck, and I can dig it. And I feel like steroids to aid in that, it ain't like steroid use in the Olympics, whereas I got like 10 human lengths on you based on something that I'm taking that you're not taking. It's not the same thing. Y'all buried him with the steroid scandal and it was unjust, stupidly unjust. And big up to the 2000 Mets as well. Queens, holla back, what it do? Y'all were the other half of the glory of 2000 and New York's domination over baseball in that year. Remember this. There's another one, right? Remember OJ interrupting my motherfucking Knicks in game five, 1994, in that goddamn white fucking Ford? And cutting in and out of the goddamn game. Patrick Ewing and them is having, is doing big things. And this fucking guy chooses this day, right? to get in the biggest goddamn sports scandal since... Shit, bro, I gotta think of some shit. I don't know what was bigger than OJ. And I'm gonna tell you, the chase interrupted my game. A very big game. Very big is an understatement. But the trial, my parents watched that whole goddamn trial. That interfered with a whole month of other shit. OJ, god damn, son. And then you still wound up and found yourself in the same jail, B. Holy shit, Orenthal. But that, that night, that evening, the Knicks was um giving it to the Bulls, I believe. Yeah. And, and you know, son, I was with my girlfriend at the time, right? She a goddamn Bulls fan. You know, we was frolicking and shit. <laughs> uh, game, you, game, uh, uh, game. She was a Bulls fan at that time, which is like, I love you, but goddamn it, son. Like, you, you know, that that's torture to a Knicks fan. In the 90s, you're talking about 94. Not only is she not rooting for the team I'm rooting for, but here come fucking OJ. Fucking Orenthal James and his high speed chase for getting yourself tangled up with white women. <laughs> nah, that was a joke. That was a joke. All my white friends, I love y'all. Cut it out, you know better. But Orenthal James and have no business with no Nicole Kidman. No, I, I'm gonna turn that, I'm gonna turn that around. Nicole Kidman and have no business fucking around with OJ. Now, white women, black women, tell me if I'm lying. But I wanna say, that night you interrupted that game, fam, put it to you like this. If we would've lost, I think I would've wanted you to go to jail. I'm done talking right there. Remember this! Remember the Whitney Houston Super Bowl? That Super Bowl, I don't even know who won that year. How about that? Whitney won that Super Bowl. And I remember we had some um, overseas kind of war threat at the time. I forgot what it was. I don't know, but some big shit happened and that Super Bowl was very emotional. America, we had some, some, some issues we was handling at that point. Everybody was at that game in a militant way and in a very patriotic way. So when Whitney hit that national anthem and put it in a way that it has never been heard before, that was monumental, that was historic. There's never been a Super Bowl where someone has sang to that level ever again. 
uh, you could, if you ask me, tell me a bigger, badder Super Bowl than Whitney Houston. Tell me someone that rostered better than Whitney Houston on that day. She put pride in the country. Even you kneelers, you anthem kneelers. Every one of y'all was standing, everybody was standing on that day. And the way she just put the three notes in the carry down of the last, like that was all Whitney, boy. Scandal always terrorizes our heroes. I have children now, so I look at these things in a different light now. I don't like to see our heroes, especially our black heroes, ridiculed. I don't like to see our all around, it don't matter what color, American heroes scandalized. Victories are few and far in between. There's a lot of dumb shit, but the good things, few and far in between. There's something about scandal that you just love to lodge it to our, our identities like it's a Lego piece. We don't go together with scandal. We're heroes of this country too. There's a lot of heroes, There's a lot of black heroes that have done things that have turned out to really be pivotal in the survival of this country. So y'all yeah, can cut that out. But the Whitney Super Bowl was a prideful day, a historical statement. I don't even know if she knew she was making the statement she made. The president, she said. I mean, she was American like you American, watching the TV, knowing what was going on politically. So, in addition, I'll say the way she sang it was purposeful too. Very strong. It's like country strong, you feel me? Like Gwyneth Paltrow, country strong. Let's switch over, just like how we got a glorious Super Bowl. Let's talk about the most scandalous one ever. The Janet Jackson Super Bowl. Remember this? Remember the Janet Jackson Super Bowl? God fucking damn. Again, I don't know who was playing in that Super Bowl right now on my head. But I know Janet's titty jumped out. I know that. I know about they had, uh, what do they call it? Uh, wardrobe malfunction? A wardrobe, how your wardrobe malfunction? Bro, her titty slipped out of her bra and y'all took it too far. I seen a documentary, a 2022 or 21 documentary that Janet did still talking about that motherfucking cursed Super Bowl where her breast slipped out. And 50, she wasn't showing it to you, she was showing it to me, son. Cut it out. But the scandal behind it, behind that mistake, again, that's another black hero. Roasted, torn apart, charred for basically doing her, her work and honoring everyone's need to see somebody of her stature at the Super Bowl. Disrespectful, ungrateful. Again, the punishment never matches the crime. Overdid it. Janet took the real shitty end of the stick for that little occurrence right there. And it wasn't deserved at all. Everybody knows that. But the media, just like football, you get a media to football, the football what they gonna do? They gonna grab it like this and start fucking marching. They're gonna start running with it. Don't give the media the fucking football. Like, we like to make big things out of small stupidness. See what I'm saying? Janet got caught up. She wasn't looking for no other attention but fans' attention to her music, her dance move, and her sound, yo. She wasn't looking for it. She didn't get in it for all that other bullshit. But I just wanted to bring that one up as the yang to the ying of Whitney. Two black women, two great heroes, two historical singers. One got the Super Bowl glory, the other got the Super Bowl scandal. You go into their lives, right? One scandaled to death, and the other, I feel like the media is still trying. They just can't find her. As soon as they see Janet's face, it's gonna be back on with the bullshit. Fuck y'all for that, man. Leave these beautiful women alone, bro. Yo, remember when Mike was moving his head? <laughs> remember this? Remember when Mike was moving his head? He was unfuckwittable. And you know which Mike I'm talking about. Don't fucking play coy. Iron Mike. When Iron Mike 
was moving his head, he was untouchable. All of y'all talking this shit now, cause y'all see he's getting older, lightening up, and you know, allowing himself to feel happy. Yeah, y'all got a problem with that. Everybody got their mouth running. Tyson, no, oh, I could beat Tyson. Tyson, ye, 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 ye. Shut the fuck up. No, you can't. And no, you damn and well couldn't ever. None of y'all. Evander, you either. You cheated, bro, with your big fucking boulder head. You feel me? You know that too. The next thing is this. When that fight was supposed to happen, I'm not gonna blame it on you that it didn't happen, but I'm just saying, you know that it didn't happen when it was supposed to happen. Son of a bitch. Mike versus EV didn't happen when it was supposed to happen. They wanted that fight when he was still moving his head. They got the fight when, when he was full of fucking coke and goddamn crosses. Coke and crosses. So fuck that fight, man. Number one and number two. Word up. Lennox, your shit too. It didn't count. That's an asterisk fight. That is an asterisk fight. I said that. You ain't catch Mike. You call old, no head moving, slower than a snail, a fucking sloth, Mike. With all types of crosses. And he hadn't started to see the light yet at all either. And y'all all knew that. Lennox, EV. I hate when y'all sit up there and take good, big, full credit when you know you didn't face the machine that was Mike. You faced the man that was Mike. I said that. Fuck it, I'll say it. The only dude that really beat him, fair and square, was Buster. And still, it's an asterisk win. Why? I'ma tell you why. When Tyson knocked Buster Douglas down, the ref took his time and let him get up. He was late. Two, two counts late. That was a knockout. Buster didn't get up in time. All right, but he let him up, he slow count. Okay, cool. When Tyson got knocked down, go back and look at the footage. The, 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 the ref was doing this when he was on nine. Fuck out of here. Fuck it, I'll say it. But out of everybody, Buster caught the best mic. All of y'all other ones could go sit down. And I know it's a lot of dudes out there that might agree or disagree with me, Hit me in the comments, baby. Press the dislike button if you don't like what I have said because I mean every word of it. You ain't see the real Mike. You ain't see the real Mike, young Mike, moving his head, Mike. You ain't see that, Mike. You don't know nothing about that. All of y'all were hiding when he was in that type of condition, when he was fighting like that. Y'all was hiding, bro. Y'all waited till Robin Givens came along. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all waited till Robin Givens came along so you could put your little campaign together. Yeah, you needed a distracted mic. You needed a drugged up, just experiencing real buns and burn mic. I had his head fucked up for maybe about six, seven years. Just the first years of getting action and burn after becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. Remember this? We're in a baseball field right now, right? And it reminds me of Colin Kaepernick. All you guys that were kneeling to the anthem or to the flag, that refused to pledge to the flag and were kneeling, 2020. That was the that was the that was the pandemic to George Floyd to Colin Kaepernick rap clap back to countrywide reform and woke athlete to team name changing and the me too doo doo to team name nitpicking but kneeling for the anthem i didn't do that shit you know why what the fuck i'm kneeling for to my flag in the country my motherfuckers built i'm a kneel i was born here but that ain't even it. A lot of people that wasn't born here built this motherfucker. Why would y'all be kneeling? It's for y'all to stand. I feel like that song represents me more than it represents the average white person. And that's not a racial statement. That's a statement saying, I claim this country as my own. Yes, my roots are African. I was born in America. And you know what? Black roots are in America, not just African soil. We got black roots dating back to freaking Jesus's sandals, right? Australia, 
freaking Antarctica. Them little, them little uh, uh, midget pygmies. What do you, what you call those guys? Living in igloos again? Eskimos. Eskimos from African descent. Eskimos that live in the snow. America is my country. It's not for me to kneel down when my song comes on. And yes, I know about the perils of that song. I know what that song entails. If you live here and you're complaining and you're a hypocrite because you reap all the benefits of living here. Well, I reap all the benefits of living here and when that national anthem plays or when that pledge and that flag goes up, I'm standing for that bitch because this is my motherfucking country. Whoever want to test me on that, holler back because it ain't about who was delegating. It's about who was carrying that fucking concrete, all that steel, all them logs, in the fields, on the train tracks, in the dirt, breaking rocks down to smaller rocks and smaller rocks than that and smaller than that. Pardon my French, but my niggas did that. So when the song comes on and my children are about to compete, play a game that when you are American, you play it with honor, whether it be BMX race, basketball, football, and especially baseball. You know what I say, kids? Stand the fuck up for that anthem. Stand up when they pledging allegiance. Put your hand over your heart and claim the country that belongs to you. Fuck all that other shit. And, oh, this country don't belong to me, and this country don't treat me right. And me, 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 me. Shut the fuck up. This is my shit. Yes, I stand for that fucking allegiance. I'll remix the song. We really need to clean it up a little bit. It's a little too violent for you. Fuck it. Bring it to me. I'll clean it up. But we ain't changing it, and I ain't changing. And yes, I have the duality of Caribbean in my culture. You're supposed to be able to know that by the way I speak and I articulate myself sometimes. But I'm American, bro. Don't get that fucked up. And anything that got to do with this country, be it a poem or a song, it belongs to me more than you. At red, white, and blue, we could fight over that. I'm going nowhere. We're going nowhere. This our shit. Remember I said that. Pause off of the seriousness of it. Even back when we were when we were in the um the General Lee War, with the, the Confederate War. Who was on the front line? I'ma throw two numbers out there. Go Google them. 54. Go look it up. 54th Infantry. But um, I don't kneel. That song, that song plays for me. It was us on the front line. That song is ours. That poem was written for us. I stand hardcore, hardcore. And that might be the most controversial statement I've ever made on Giuseppe's drama umbrella. How do you feel about it?